We're in a series called I'm Not Okay, and um, I, I want to thank you so much for so much uh, feedback last week. I've heard so much affirmation, so much just uh, telling me that this is right on time, and I'm grateful to be um, right at the right series at the right time. And, and God had us shift this series around in our calendar, and I'm feeling like it's lining up for a lot of people. And the area I'm tackling today is something that I believe is a, a core issue that many of us have struggled with, if not all of us have. Um, but we don't often tell other people. It stays hidden inside of our soul. I'll get started by remembering the first day. Anybody here... Um, ever struggled and had to change schools before. Y'all y'all remember first day of a new school, whether it's moving from elementary to middle or middle to high. Um, my family, I grew up born and raised outside of New Orleans, and my dad got a job transfer when I was going into my sixth grade year outside of Baton Rouge. And so we moved from New Orleans to Baton Rouge, and I went from a private school to a public school in sixth grade. And I'm just telling you, I had a rude awakening like I was not expecting, okay? Some of my siblings watch from Louisiana every week online. I want to say welcome to you and everybody else who's online. I think my older brother handled the change better than any of us. I personally thought I was going to handle the change quite well. Our younger sister, well, we threw her to the wolves. I just, I, I just feel like she... She, was, uh, she, she had the hardest time making the change, but I remember thinking, I'm okay, I'm good, um, I, don't, I don't prefer it, I didn't prefer leaving my friends, but hey, new change, new start, and then I walked into this school and immediately an inner sense of, you don't belong here, you don't have any friends, who are you going to roll with? Come on, lunch is already approaching. I could give a rip about class one, two, three, or four and the subject matter because if I got no one to sit with at lunch, I could care less about math. <laughs> Come on, I could care less about where the comma goes in the grammatical sentence. I just need to know who my people are. I just need to know who I'm rolling with. And on the inside, I started sensing, you're not as good as you thought you were. <laughs> you're not as okay as you thought you were. I I even am going to get a bit vulnerable. I, I look back at that time and I think, man, you were really insecure because I, I realized, oh, what do I have to do to fit in? I'm willing to consider doing that. I'm likely to consider becoming that if you'll let me roll with you. And it almost felt too desperate on my end as I look back and evaluate myself. But we all know what it feels like when we feel like we're struggling with belonging. Maybe you married into a family and you're struggling to feel like belonging with that family. Maybe you've just changed schools. Maybe you're here and you moved to colleges to come here and you left your home place and we want to say, welcome home. You can find belonging here. Come on, somebody help some people feel like belonging up in here. Maybe you never really felt like you fit in with certain people or, 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 or you've just kind of struggled in certain areas to belong. But I discovered in myself just how crucial it was because I could, I, I, I could become unhealthy if I did not find belonging. And the Bible, uh, not the Bible, we have learned this just about everybody in human nature, that belonging is one of all of our core, foundational, fundamental needs, and we're searching for it. And I believe that we need to find it first and foremost in God, in his church, and then from there forward we can walk in a healthy pattern of finding it in the relationships all around us. So today's message is entitled, and I want you to take notes today, it's entitled Battling with Belonging. Battling with Belonging. If you've got your Bible, once you've written that down, turn to Genesis chapter 3. You're going to discover from a very early onset in our Bible, early on in human nature, this was a problem even from the beginning. 
This is a problem that Satan likes to attack too. And we might not always feel like it's the most spiritual of all problems, but isn't Satan cunning like that? If I can attack you over here and your mind's not directly tying it to a spiritual matter, well, you might go trying to fix that on your own strength, in your own, in, in your own abilities, with your own gift mix. And, and we need to understand that when we are weak, God is strong in us, and we need to turn to him and find it in him before any other place in this world. Can I get an amen? amen. And so before we get into Genesis chapter 3, let me just set it up for you in case you're newer to Genesis that this passage comes right after Adam, uh, the, the, the seven days happened. On the sixth day, God created man. And when he created man, he had only created man. And one of the early things that he gave man to do is... Why don't you go out and name the animals? And, and, and so I think this is a brilliant time. This is why we get things like rhinoceros. Why? Because frog was used up. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm running out of things to call this. And I'm like, wow, that's an interesting creature. Platypus. And God's like, platypus? Really? That's what we're going with? Okay. And he just kept naming animals and the point of the matter was they're coming to you two by two they have herds they have peoples they have their tribe they have their group they have their belonging situations and as you name all of them you will discover in yourself you don't have yours yet I need you to understand just how important relationships are while he is doing this he he, he needs to understand that that um you need relationships, and so he comes to the place where God says, it's not good for man to be alone, and, he, and the Bible says that as he slept out of his rib uh, uh, came a, a woman, and, and the man looked at the woman and said, whoa, man, come on, and that's how we get that name. I know it's a cheesy joke, but it's still happening in 2024. Come on. I tell my wife, you got my rib. Come on. Got my rib, girl. Okay, so it's it's the hottest pickup line. You know, she just loves it. She melts when I say that. God, God's trying to show man and giving a woman that there's an inherent message that there's something crucially important about relationships and belonging and having a place where you feel like you belong. And, since the enemy looks to distort all that God has created, he looks to pervert everything good that God created, he seeks to separate us. Immediately, with Adam and Eve, his first role is to separate them from God and to separate them from each other. Maybe I can insert an argument. Maybe I can insert separation. Maybe I can insert space. Maybe I can mess up a good thing. And he begins to attack man from God, man from woman, man from his place in the garden, and man from his inherent purpose that God gave him in the first place. And so we pick up in Genesis chapter 3. It says, starting in verse 7, at that moment, after they had sinned, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves, and when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord walking about in the garden. And so they hid from the Lord among the trees, and then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And they replied, uh, or, or he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. And so immediately, you see that sin begins to separate. Sin always starts to affect a ton of things, and it affects our belonging too. They immediately start struggling with three things. They start thinking, I don't belong here in this garden. I don't belong here in God's presence. I must hide because I, I, I don't feel like I belong here. They start secondly feeling like I don't belong to God. I've messed up. I'm ashamed. I'm full of embarrassment. I'm feeling distance from God. I don't belong here. And they even start wrestling a little bit with I don't belong to each other. Come on. She made me do it. That's a bad move. guys. <laughs> Come on. God goes, Adam, what happened? She 
did it. She did it. Smooth move. It's going to go well for you in your relationship, right? And, and, and so immediately distance is happening. Belonging in every single relationship is becoming strained, if not divisive. And today, I want my goal is to take back what the enemy has stolen from you by stomping on all of his well-laid plans and letting you know what God has in mind. Let me start with two core truths. Two, two scriptures that I didn't even give uh, uh, the, 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 the media team. And so I'll write these down. Psalm 68, 6 says, God placed is the lonely in families. In other words, if you don't feel belonging, God wants to bring belonging really quick. And so that is a foundational truth. Do not buy the lie of the enemy that says you're an outcast. You've got some sort of weird third eye on your head. Everybody's talking about you. You don't fit in anywhere. Everybody else has family, but you don't. You don't deserve family. You've messed up too much. Don't believe the lie because God wants to bring belonging. Psalm 100 verse 3 is the second one that I want as a core foundational truth. The Bible says, you know the Lord is God. How many of y'all know that? Say amen. amen. He created, created us and we belong to him. Someone say belong. We belong to him. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And can I tell you that when you get in your core before anything else, that I belong to him, then the cares of this world become secondary. And I no longer feel the peer pressure to become something I am not because I already know I belong to him. Someone say, I belong to him. him. So three areas today to help us battle with belonging. And I want you to take notes on this. Let me set up this first one before I give it to you. When we struggle with belonging, as I said, We'll do almost anything to fit in. I realize this. I'll start dressing like that. I'll start talking like that. I'll consume that. I'll smoke that. I'll become that. If you'll keep dating me, I will do that. I will allow that. If you'll call me pretty, if you'll call me good, if you'll call me worthy, I will, I will do these things. I'll cut my hair like that. I will start wearing these types of things. It's almost as if we are saying internally, I'll do whatever you want in exchange for belonging. Belonging. Whatever you want, I'll consider it, if not do it, in exchange. And when you think about some of the vices in our life, oftentimes they came into our life because somebody else was doing it and we wanted to belong. Oh, you're watching what? I'll binge that too. Oh, you're dressing like what? I'll do that too. Oh, you're, you're consuming this? Oh, I'll do that too. Oh, y'all talk like this? I'll talk like that too. It's because we're looking to belong. I start becoming things that I should not out of belonging. And, and the problem with this is it leads to two things that can be um, divisive and harmful in our relational skills. We either become used. Y'all know these people. If you're that vulnerable to do whatever I want, then I will use you for my own gain. Or you'll get pushed away as labeled a tryhard. I don't want to hang with you. Like you don't have any core convictions and you do anything and, and, and you're, you are a tryhard. Like you are trying too hard. I was on the verge in middle school of becoming a tryhard. Like, come on. It was just like, what are y'all into? I'm into it too. Come on. And, and so I finally found my tribe when I found some musicians. And that's really probably what shaped a lot of who I became. I became a musician playing in barrooms since I was 14 years old because that was the first group of people that accepted me and I knew how to play a guitar. And they were like, we have guitar players. We need a bass player. I said, I'll become that. Can I roll with you? (laughs) I know it's seemingly pathetic, but we've all done this. We've all done this. We've all felt this. And the Lord can use this. And I put together this simple equation when we have no belonging and you add to it immaturity, you're talking about an incredibly vulnerable, unhealthy state. When you have no belonging and you have immaturity, both camps have the opportunity to exploit this. Now, by both camps, I mean this. The enemy says, oh my goodness, I can take advantage of this soul. 
This is a great time to get them plugged in with the wrong people. Why? Because good, uh, a bad company corrupts good character. And so I don't have to attack their faith right away. If I just get them around the wrong influences and headed down the wrong path, then that's how I know I can get you. Come on, young people who are dating, come on. You need to have some people who are older than you that are speaking life into your life. And you need to ask them, are you in approval of them? Because sometimes there have been mentors and people further along longer long than me who has been able to see things I could not see for myself if some of y'all know that say amen. amen not just picking on young people we can be a little bit older in age and still acting young in our decisions and we're making immature decisions because I, if I can belong with you and if we have immaturity with no belonging we're vulnerable but here's the other thing guys I also think that when I run into people like this I don't use that to label or judge someone I realize there is no better time for them to get plugged in and invited to church and to meet Jesus Christ than right now come on it's not up to if I feel like it or not it's not up to if I'm comfortable or not their soul is weighing in the balance and if enemy is fighting for them I'm gonna fight for them too come on as a youth pastor we used to do an event every single uh, beginning of the school year that basically I told our team who it's basically a reach of freshmen because stats say that when a freshman goes into high school there is no more vulnerable time in their life because they're saying if I can roll with you I will become just like you I will do whatever you want and so we put an event on two weeks into the school season and, and asked every single person in our church, every young person, we commissioned them, go out there and invite someone who does not know Jesus to church because they need to get connected with God before the enemy says, I got him in my back pocket. Can I get an amen? amen? So three areas to help battle belonging, and I know this might not feel good, but I, 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 sometimes I just got to be a pastor, and I'm, I'm speaking to myself a lot of times too. Number one, grow up. had to set that one up because the immaturity in us mixed with belonging not feeling like we belong make us really vulnerable and we've got to grow up first corinthians 3 says this and when i was with you i couldn't talk to you as i would to spiritual people i had to talk to you though though you belong uh, as though you belong to this world as though you were still infants in christ I had to feed you milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And this is what I never want one of my leaders to say to me, and you still aren't ready. I know that's difficult. It's difficult to hear, but it's good teaching sometimes too, and multiple times throughout the Bible, it teaches us about maturing us. Now, listen, I'm so proud of you guys because last week I recommended this book, and you guys sold us out in the first week. Like, you bought up everyone, and can I tell you, Lauren and I are proud pastors when y'all take what we're sharing and what we're, 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 we're leading with, and you run with it. Can I get some, give each other a hand clap of praise right now? Because you make us proud pastors, and I'm so honored to walk with you in this. And so we ordered more. I hope more are at the table. I'm not sure if they came in in time. But in chapter 7, Peter Scazzaro uh, shares something. He gets really honest about our emotional maturity. And I just want to say this. I do not get a kick out of hurting the flock, okay? I don't get a kick out of gut punches. There is no uh, 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 desire in me for you to walk away feeling hurt from this, but I do have a responsibility to, to grow and mature us, so I want to put some good food for thought in front of us today, okay? So hear my heart. He says in chapter 7, he says that many of us are, are maybe older in age, but emotionally we're younger than we think. And so he, he breaks it down this way. There's four stages, and they're going to put it up there. And if you want to take a picture, I would encourage you to take a picture after all four are up there, or else you're going to take four different pictures. I'm just trying to help you out. It says, many of us are emotional infants, and how do I know? How do I identify an emotional infant? They look for others to take care of them. They have great difficulty entering into the world of others. They are driven by need for instant gratification. And they use others as objects to meet their needs. He says the next level is emotional children. 
they are content and happy as long as they receive what they want. They unravel quickly from stress, disappointments, and trials. They interpret disagreements as personal offenses and attacks on them. They are easily hurt. They complain, withdraw, or become sarcastic when they don't get their way. They have great difficulty calmly discussing their needs and wants in a mature, loving way. Uh -uh Uh-uh-uh, this is not about your neighbors. Some of y'all are going, I know who needs this. Come on. (laughs) There is no elbow nudging right now. You paying attention to this? This is good teaching, Pastor. No, 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 no. (laughs) Focus back in and and focus on self. Here's, Here's the next level. Emotional adolescents tend to be defensive, are threatened and alarmed by criticism, They keep score of what they give so that they can ask for something later in return. They deal with conflict poorly, often blaming, appeasing, going to a third party, pouting or ignoring the issue entirely. We ain't going to talk about this. Or they are critical and judgmental. And here's the last stage. Emotional adults, how do I know if I'm doing healthy in my EQ? Well, maybe hopefully a lot of these things characterize me. Are able to ask for what they need, want, or prefer clearly, directly, and honestly. They recognize, manage, and take responsibility for their own thoughts and feelings. It's not your fault I feel this way. It's my fault I feel this way. They can, when, even when under stress, state their own beliefs and values without becoming adversarial. They respect others without having to change them. They give people room to make mistakes and not be perfect. And they have the capacity to resolve conflict maturely and negotiate solutions that consider the perspectives of others. Now, come on. If you're anything like me, I'll just be transparent. I jump from some of these from time to time. And knowing these things help me understand what I need to address maybe in me first. So I don't share this to pick on anybody. Neither did Peter. I think he did it to help us identify when we ourselves need to take another step in our growth and maturation. And one of the best ways to do that is joining a freedom group. One more time, I want to give a shout out that our freedom people, 76 people were at a conference just the last Friday and Saturday. And it is one of the best groups to try to walk from where you are today into a healthier you. And we offer it every spring and every fall. So earmark it if you've not been through one, that you want to get in one in our fall small group semester number two. Ways to get healthy. Ways to um, uh, help battle belonging. Number two is use up. Use up. What do I mean by this? First one's grow up. Second one's use up. Use up your entire brain, not just half of your brain. This was almost revelatory when I started kind of studying this because if you're anything like me, we lean into only half of our brain. Let me show you this diagram right here. The left side of our brain, especially in our spirituality, they're going to put it up there, is responsible for uh, understanding doctrine, uh, scripture meditation, beliefs, and strategies. And oftentimes, we associate this as the most spiritual of all spiritual things that we can do. And so a lot of times in church or a lot of times in our Bible, we are using the left side of our brain. But let me show you the right side of our brain. The right side of our brain is wired to desire relationships and to make them healthy, to bring about connections. It's it's about connecting with who we love. It's managing emotions and joy. And God said, let all of your mind praise God. He did not say, let the left side of your mind ever praise God. He did not say, let the right side of your mind ever praise God. He said, with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind say all of my mind let all of it be for God he says the first is the greatest commandment and the second second is equally important love your neighbor as yourself in other words do not ignore the right side of your brain because oftentimes and I do this quite often I associate the spiritual things as left-brained And I need to bring my whole thing to it because God is just as interested in the left side as the right side of me being healthy. I wrote it this way. Your social life is part of your spiritual life. Did you know that? Your social life is part of 
your spiritual life. I run into people all the time who say, I love God, I don't love the church, I don't need the church. And I'm like, last, okay, I get it. You know, thank you that you can left brain this whole thing and say, God's still my God, even if relationships, I don't do that. But last I checked, God said we are a body and the knee can't operate well without the elbow. And so it's really bizarre for a knee to be sitting up in a room all by itself, trying to live healthily all by itself because I haven't seen a knee in a doctor's office in some sort of jar do something significant and by the way God said he is the head of the body and I don't serve a decapitated God and so we can't decapitate ourselves from it so I understand churches have problems I understand I'm part of the church and I have problems and shortcomings but that does not give me an excuse to go I'm going all left brain on this thing and I'm ignoring right brain. I'm not getting in a small group. I'm not meeting anybody. I'm not going to join a dream team and get connected with anybody. I'm not going to do relationships. I'm just going to get the meet and go home. You are missing half of it. Use up. Use up all of your brain. See, show the right brain again. If we ignore this right side right here, we will become Christians who believe in God's love because we read it, we study it, we meditate it, but we have difficulty experiencing God's love. It's all head knowledge because we're only left-braining this thing. Show me the, the left brain again. If we ignore the left side, we will love being in community with others but not know what we believe. So when the crap hits the fan, we're willing to change our theology and wander from the true faith because we don't know what the true faith is as long as you'll accept me and roll with me. I'll become like that and I'll wander into it. Is this helping anybody? And so we got to invest in relationships as part of your spirituality. I cannot emphasize enough that small groups is vital to this. This is why we have them. We don't have them to offer something to fill up the calendar. We have them because they're healthy for me, for you, for everybody to get to know each other's names. Next month, we'll have a new round of summer small groups, and it's time for you to get back in one or get in one for the very first time. Somebody say, I'm getting in one. I knew that would kind of be weak. Someone say, I'm getting in one. I'm trying to help you out. Number three, number three, number three, the social side is going. Right brain's not awake yet, Pastor. That's why I didn't answer that one, right? The third area of helping battle belonging is to not just grow up, not just to use up, but to open up. Open up. I sat in a church staff meeting years ago, years ago. And there was a lady in the group, and we were talking about connections, and she said this statement that hasn't left me because it didn't hit quite right. And she said, I have my core relationships. I've got my people. I hope they find theirs, but I've got no room for anybody else. I understood the heart of what she was trying to say. We all have, like, our people. Like, <laughs> this is who I'm most comfortable with. And sometimes we can try to say, I got mine, but what you're inherently saying too is, hope you find yours. And I'm just so grateful that Jesus never said that about me. I got this whole section. I don't have room for y'all. Hope you figure it out. God never did that. And so while I understood what she was saying, I just didn't think it was biblical emotionally I kind of get it I got my tribe I've got my people I'm comfortable with I trust them whatever I don't know if I want to let somebody else in but biblically we don't give permission to isolate people in fact Matthew chapter 25 says it like this Jesus once taught for I was hungry and you fed me I was thirsty and you gave me a drink I was a stranger and you invited me into your home I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you took the time to visit me. And when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Can I say it honestly? He is saying you loved me when you loved the ones not as easy to love. Because someone comes to you hungry, you're like, oh, they're going to take a lot out of me. 
Someone comes to me thirsty. Someone's in the hospital. I'm going to have to get in my car and leave my TV set to go drive and see them. Someone's in the prison. That's going to mess up my flow. I don't, I, I don't know if I have time for that kind of thing. Someone's hungry. Someone's naked. Well, you're naked. Figure it out. And when you are, it'll be safer to be in relationship with you because I can see that there's some issues right now. And so I don't want to get too close because it could be too much for me. And Jesus is saying, when you love people that are harder to love, you're loving on me directly another scripture says that when you care for people you might be entertaining angels you didn't even know it and so I understood what the woman meant but we don't have the right to say I got mine there's no room for the next person who walks in and I understand that could be difficult I love this I live by this motto do for one what you wish you could do for everyone because if you don't do for one what you wish you could do for everyone, you will start doing for no one what you can't do for everyone. And we isolate ourselves and we give ourselves a non-biblical excuse to do nothing. And so I know this is, um, I hope it's helpful today. In fact, can I give a shout out? We started a jail ministry. Uh, a, a, a jail ministry about a month and a half ago. We've got probably 10 people on the personnel who's gone through training over at our local uh, system. It's called Good Outcomes. And in the first meeting, one of our volunteers went in there. Four women gave their life to Jesus Christ right up in, two blocks away. I have been so looking forward to a ministry like this starting, and I'm going to look into the camera right now because a lot of times you, uh, our team streams these messages for you, and so I'm speaking directly to you. If you're an incarcerated individual, and if you want to get closer to God, if you want to make a change in your life, we have people here who have been through a similar story, and I'm telling you, you are welcome here. You can come up in here. You can find a home. You can start a new life. You can walk it out with someone who will encourage you because God is encouraging you and we're just his ambassadors. And so we say, welcome home. Come on, Lift Church. Give it up for them. Because I needed a second start. And I needed somebody not to judge me right away when I came into the church. And so I once heard it like this, and I'll finish by saying this. Love beyond your preferences. Love beyond your preferences. Well, my, my preference is this age. My preference is this color. My preference is, is this socioeconomic status. My preference is, 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 is people who dress like this. My preferences are people from the east side or people from the west side. or people. No, 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 no. Love beyond your preferences because that's what I read in Matthew chapter 25. And it challenges me. Do not get comfortable in your own little rut. Love beyond your current context. So as I close, I want to pray over you that you would let God grow you. We're going to grow up. That you would let God use up all of your mind in a fresh new way. And that you would let God open up your heart to some people who are looking for belonging all around us. That you might be the angel sent to them to help them find life and security before they found destroying themselves in the world. God, we need this. We're not the best on our own. We all have our preferences. We all have our, our backgrounds. We have biases. And, and, and Father, you said to use up all of our mind. And so, Father, would you grow us so that we are not uh, uh, um, fragile and vulnerable to be exploited by the devil just because we're not finding belonging? Would you help us find belonging in you right now in this moment? In fact, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you know, I, I have not belonged to him completely. I've given him parts of my life, moments of my week, but it's time to go all in, and I want to belong to him completely. If that's you, without, I'm, I'm not going to embarrass you or call you forward, but I don't want you to be embarrassed to have a moment where you can just throw your hand up into the air and say, God, this is me. I'm going all in. I confess my sins, and I want to belong to you completely. Hands are already going up. If that's you, would you just throw your hand up and join them? I'm seeing hands all over the room. If you're online right now, come on. You can participate, too. God's calling you, too. I would love it if you'd write in the chat, I'm in, too. I'm in too, and I see many hands in this place. 
The Bible says this for those who are raising their hands, that if we will believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And so I'm going to lead us into a prayer right now that I'm going to ask you to repeat. And the whole church is going to join you right now. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. I know I've made mistakes. I've committed sins. And I'm asking you to forgive me of them right now. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And when he died on that cross, he died to forgive me right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for a fresh start. I'm starting all over today with a clean slate because of the way you loved me. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church said amen and amen. Amen and amen.